It all started in 2002 with Gangs of New York. The epic period film went on to be nominated for over 100 awards, including 10 Oscars at the 2003 Academy Awards. Since then, actor Leonardo DiCaprio and director Martin Scorsese have gone on to work on five blockbuster films together. It's become one of the premier collaborations in Hollywood. At least, that's five so far. I'm sure they're not done yet. As of this recording, the latest in that line of collaborations was 2013's The Wolf of Wall Street. It received positive reviews and also held the honor of topping the most pirated films list of 2014. That's according to the copyright tracking firm Excipio, which puts out a list of the most pirated films each year. Their report indicated The Wolf of Wall Street was the most pirated in 2014 with over 30 million illegal downloads. But that didn't stop The Wolf of Wall Street from raking in almost $400 million, about four times what it cost to make, and making it Martin Scorsese's highest grossing film. Oh, and as a fun little fact, the movie also had variations on the F word being said 569 times. Since the film clocks in at an even 180 minutes or exactly three hours, that comes to 3.16 uses per minute. That is the most uses in a mainstream film, assuming you don't count 2014's Swearnet, the movie, and a documentary that's solely dedicated to the word. And the swearing is just a part of it. The film was on the path to an NC-17 rating thanks to the rampant use of explicit sex, drugs, and of course, the swearing. But that wouldn't work in theaters, so Scorsese agreed to remove a few scenes filled with sex and nudity so it could get an R rating. If you've seen the movie, you'll know just how crazy the story is. Surely, most of that was added for the big screen. Or was it? I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is Based on a True Story. Before we jump into today's story, I wanted to let you know that this show is supported by listeners just like you. And if you want to support this show, you can do that over at Patreon. If you're not familiar with Patreon, it's a third-party website that lets you directly support content creators like me. You can sign up to be a patron of the show over at patreon.com slash based on a true story. There's no obligation, and whatever you can offer goes a long way to making sure I can continue to pay the numerous costs of the show and continue providing what you hopefully find as quality content. And as an added little bonus, I like to give my patrons some extra goodies. So if you've ever wondered why a movie was picked or how the show comes together, or even just what's coming next week, all while helping make sure that this show continues, hop over to patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast. Once again, that's patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast. You can find a link to that in the show notes too. And now let's compare history with Hollywood's version of The Wolf of Wall Street. The Wolf of Wall Street tells the story of Wall Street broker Jordan Belfort, who's played by Leonardo DiCaprio. We're introduced to Leonardo DiCaprio's version of Jordan as he explains a bit about his life. His wife Naomi, played by Margot Robbie, his 170-foot yacht, the fact that he has sex with hookers five or six times a week, and he does a ton of drugs. After this rather stunning introduction that sets the pace of the film, we go back to learn about how Jordan broke into well, the broker business. According to the movie, Jordan didn't grow up with wealth, but at the age of 22, Jordan got a job at the investment firm L.F. Rothschild on Wall Street. That's where he got hooked on money. This background is mostly true, with the exception of his age. Jordan was born in 1962 in New York City, and just like the movie says, both of his parents were accountants. After dropping out of dentistry school, when the dean of the University of Maryland School of Dentistry told him that dentistry is the wrong place to make a lot of money, Jordan moved to Long Island, where he started selling meat and seafood. For a short while, things were going well, but the business ended up forcing Jordan to file for bankruptcy at the age of 25. So, it was at the age of 25 that a family friend helped him get back on his feet by finding a job for him as a trainee stockbroker at L.F. Rothschild. 
In the movie, it's while at L.F. Rothschild that Jordan's boss, Mark Hanna, as played by Matthew McConaughey, that Jordan learns the real secret to Wall Street, cocaine and hookers. Well, that and the stockbroker's ability to convince their clients to reinvest any earnings they have into a new stock along with just a little bit more money. Each time, the client is getting rich on paper while the stockbroker makes bank on the commissions. According to the real Jordan Belfort's memoirs, this actually happened. Mark Hanna gave him advice early on about how to make money on Wall Street and the drugs and hookers. For a while, this works. Then, just like in the movie, Black Monday hits. The movie glosses over this, but Black Monday was on October 19th, 1987. Stock markets around the world crashed. In the United States, the Dow Jones fell 508 points. Millions of dollars were lost overnight. And again, according to the real Jordan, this was the catalyst for his getting canned at L.F. Rothschild. It wasn't anything personal. A lot of people lost their jobs as a result of the market crash. On the hunt for a job again, the next part of the movie is also correct. Jordan returned to Long Island where he started working for a company called Investor Center. What the movie doesn't mention though is this little company was owned by a larger company called Stratton Securities. So while the movie does mention Jordan going off on his own to form Stratton Oakmont, it wasn't quite the startup like the movie implies. Instead, after a year of working at Investor Center, Jordan earned enough to buy out Stratton Securities and that's how Stratton Oakmont was formed. Just like in the movie, Jordan hired a bunch of his friends to be his first stockbrokers. Although the whole sell me this pen stereotypical salesman technique wasn't something that Jordan did. That was added for the movie. In the movie, one of those friends is Donnie Azoff, played by Jonah Hill. The two meet in a diner after Donnie noticed Jordan's nice car and asks him how much money he makes. Donnie was so impressed by Jordan's making $72,000 in the last month that he immediately quit his job and went to go work for Jordan. That did not happen. In fact, Donnie Azoff is not a real person. Donnie is a composite character, but the majority of his character in the film was based on Danny Porouche. In real life, Danny met Jordan through his wife. Oh, but Danny's wife was his cousin, just like Donnie's wife in the movie. Stratton Oakmont grew fast, just like the movie indicated. In the movie, there's a moment where Forbes does a profile on Stratton Oakmont. Leo's version of Jordan is upset that Forbes calls him, quote, a twisted Robin Hood, end quote, and they come up with the nickname, The Wolf of Wall Street. Forbes did do a profile on Jordan. The Forbes article came out on October 14th, 1991, and Forbes staff writer Rula Kalaf did call him, quote, Twisted Robin Hood who takes from the rich and gives to himself and his merry band of brokers, end quote. But the article did not come up with the Wolf of Wall Street moniker. According to the Forbes article, Stratton, quote, specializes in pushing dicey stocks on gullible investors, end quote. Back in the movie, it's about this point that Leo's version of Jordan meets Naomi, played by Margot Robbie. And it's about this point that Leo starts thinking of divorcing his then-wife, Teresa. In the movie, Teresa is played by Kristen Milioti. That's true, although the names were different in the movie than in real life. Jordan's first wife was named Denise Lombardo, and Jordan was married to her from 1985 to 1991. Jordan divorced Denise after he met Nadine Caridi at a Stratton Oakmont party, and that same year, Jordan and Nadine were married. In the movie, Jordan's wedding present for Naomi is a 170-foot yacht, which he calls the Naomi after her. This is true, although since Jordan's second wife was named Nadine, the boat wasn't called the Naomi, it was called the Nadine. But their marriage was far from a happy one. After the honeymoon phase, the movie shows Jordan's typical morning ritual. Fight with Naomi about whatever he did the night before, go in the steam room to get the drugs out from the day before, and finally assess the damage and seek to make up with Naomi. These specifics were taken straight from the real Jordan's book. The scene where Naomi spreads her legs open and, and tells Jordan he won't be getting sex for a long time, only to find out she's in full view of the security tape. According to Jordan, that's true. 
Back at the office in the movie, one of the craziest scenes for Donnie is when he eats the pet fish from the Silicon Valley guy, Thomas Middleditch. He plays Hooli's co-founder, Richard Hendricks, in Silicon Valley. Okay, so The Wolf of Wall Street was released the year before Silicon Valley came out. And in the movie, Thomas obviously wasn't playing Richard Hendricks. In the movie, he's actually credited as, quote, Stratton Broker in a bow tie, end quote. But he'll always be the Silicon Valley guy to me. Okay, so anyway, Jordan Hill's version of Donnie swallows the Silicon Valley guy's pet fish and then fires him. Amazingly, this is true. Well, at least Danny Perouche claims it's true. If you remember, Danny is the guy that Donnie's character was mostly based on. We don't have any other proof of this other than Danny's word, so I guess we'll just have to take him for it. And considering how much drugs and alcohol was common in the Stratton Oakmont offices, it's actually not surprising that some crazy things happened. This fish-eating moment happened on, according to Leo's version of Jordan, the biggest day in Stratton's history. They're launching Steve Madden's IPO. In the movie, Steve Madden is played by Jake Hoffman. Just like in the movie, the real Stratton Oakmont was the firm who launched Steve Madden Inc.'s initial public offering for his women's shoe company. And just like in the movie, Steve was a childhood friend of Danny Perouche, the guy who Jonah Hill's character is primarily based on. The movie doesn't really mention this, but the real Steve Madden was tangled up in the Stratton Oakmont scheme. In 2002, he was convicted of stock manipulation, money, and securities fraud. Before he went to prison, though, Steve resigned as CEO of Steve Madden Limited, and then he accepted a position at Steve Madden Limited as a creative consultant for a handsome salary of $700,000 a year. He was sentenced to 31 months and still drew that salary while he was in prison. But that's after the events in the movie. Back in the movie's timeline, after the IPO of Steve Madden's company, the FBI is starting to put things together. Agent Denham, played by Kyle Chandler, starts to catch on to the illegal behavior of what's going on at Stratton Oakmont. He even meets with Leo version of Jordan on his yacht, the Naomi. That did not happen, and as you can probably guess, Agent Patrick Denham is another fake name. In truth, the agent at the FBI who was tracking Jordan Belfort was FBI Special Agent Gregory Coleman. Knowing the FBI is investigating him, in the movie, Jordan decides to start hiding his money. He's going to do this by moving it to a Swiss bank account to get the cash to Switzerland. He needs someone with a European passport. And he finds someone in Naomi's aunt, Emma, who is played by Joanne and Lumley. But there's way too much cash for one person to take, so they need more. And they go with Jordan's drug dealer's wife, Chantelle, a stripper born in Switzerland. The drug dealer's name is Brad, and he's played by John Bernthal, and Chantelle is played by Katerina Cass. The names are changed. For example, Brad is based on the real Todd Garrett, a drug dealer who provided Jordan with quaaludes. But the basic gist of this whole scheme is pretty accurate, and Emma was actually named Patricia. But this is how the real Jordan moved his money to Switzerland. Oh, and while the details of the argument and the exchange are fictionalized, just like in the movie, Jordan's drug dealer friend Brad botched a money handoff with Danny Perouche. The FBI, meanwhile, is getting closer. As a quick side note, the private investigator in the movie, Bo Deedle, is actually played by himself. And that's the real PI that the real Jordan Belfort hired to try to find out what the FBI was investigating. In the movie, Bo warns Jordan that his home is tapped, and after taking an obscene amount of lemon 714 pills, he drives his Lamborghini Countach from a country club to his home. Then Leonardo DiCaprio and Jonah Hill proceed to have the slowest fight in movie history. It's pretty funny to see. And again, the details weren't quite that way, but the basic gist of this is true. For example, according to the real Jordan Belfort, it wasn't a Lamborghini, but a Mercedes that he drove while high on expired quaaludes. Oh, and if you're like me and you're not really familiar with what quaaludes are, that's a brand name of a methaqualone drug. It's a sedative drug that's used to treat anxiety. It's also incredibly addictive. Well, not related to this at all, in 2015, comedian Bill Cosby admitted to drugging women he wanted to have sex with using quaaludes. Leo's version of Jordan in the movie is shocked when he sees the banged up Lamborghini. He's amazed he didn't get hurt. He's amazed he didn't hurt anyone else. That is not true. 
he did hurt someone else. While the real Jordan couldn't recall this happening because he was so high, while driving his Mercedes, he caused a head-on collision that sent the driver of the other car to the hospital. Fortunately, she ended up being okay. In the movie, while Leo's version of Jordan has taken the yacht to Italy, they find out Aunt Emma has passed away. Naomi is grief-stricken, and you can tell Jordan is also sad, but for a different reason. What about the $20 million Aunt Emma has in her Swiss bank account for him? This actually happened. Patricia passed away while Jordan's money was still in her name in Swiss banks. And just like in the movie, the real Jordan convinced the boat's captain to go through a storm in the Mediterranean Sea. And again, just like in the movie, the storm won. The Nadine sank off the coast of Italy, and the passengers and the crew had to be rescued by an Italian Navy helicopter. According to the real Jordan Belfort, there was one thing the movie got wrong here, though. The helicopter on the yacht didn't fall off on its own. They had to push it off to make room for the Italian Navy chopper to lower a commando to rescue them. Why was it an Italian Navy commando rescuing them? Jordan didn't ever say. In the movie, things started to fall apart for Jordan when he gets arrested while filming an infomercial. That didn't really happen. Well, not during the filming of an infomercial, but Jordan did get arrested. It was FBI Special Agent Gregory Coleman who had been tracking Jordan for over six years before he finally made his move. While the movie made it seem like Jordan had met FBI Agent Denham, in truth, Jordan didn't meet the FBI agent after him until Agent Coleman showed up at Jordan's home to arrest him. Faced with decades in prison, Jordan is offered the chance to cooperate in the movie. And, just like in real life, he agrees to cooperate. In the movie, when Jordan tells Naomi he's agreed to cooperate with the FBI in exchange for a reduced sentence, she says, I'm happy for you. They have sex, and then she tells Jordan that's the last time. She wants a divorce. Enraged, Jordan punches Naomi in the gut and runs to grab his daughter Skylar and rushes out to the car. With Naomi yelling at him, Jordan backs the car through the garage door and wrecks it. This happened. Jordan, while high, crashed his car into a six-foot pillar at the edge of his driveway. He never admitted to gut-punching Nadine, though, but he did admit to kicking her down the stairs while he was holding their daughter. Oh, and Nadine and Jordan didn't have just the one child. They had two children together, and the couple divorced in 2005. That's years after Jordan was indicted in 1998. Back at the office, there's a moment where Leo's version of Jordan is wearing a wire and he walks into the office with Donnie. While they're chatting, Jordan passes Donnie a note that says, quote, Don't incriminate yourself. I'm wearing a wire. End quote. In truth, Jordan passed that note to another of his friends, Dave Beale, not the character Jonah Hill's version of Donnie was based on, Danny Perush. According to the movie, thanks to his cooperation, in helping bring down some of his friends, Jordan was sentenced to 36 months or three years in prison and fined $110 million. That's true, although the movie doesn't mention how much of that time he actually served. In truth, Jordan served 22 months. And as for the $110 million that was supposed to go to the victims of his scams, just like Jordan didn't serve the full 36 months, he also apparently hasn't paid the money that he owes. According to a report by Brooklyn Federal Prosecutors that was released just before the 2013 movie hit theaters, Jordan had only paid about $11.6 million of the $110 million he was ordered to pay to the 1,513 victims identified in his 2003 court case. Oh, and... 10.4 million of that 11.6 was money that they seized from court-ordered property forfeiture. Oh, and the same report also indicated that Jordan had made over $700,000 from the book deal for The Wolf of Wall Street, which was the book that the movie was based on. He wrote the book while he was in prison during those 22 months, and after his cellmate, the comedian Tommy Chong, encouraged him to write about his crazy stories. Then he made another 125000 from the movie producers for the rights to turn the book into a movie. 
But according to Jordan's lawyers, he's made, quote, repeated efforts over the last two plus years to pay 100% of the profits of the movie and the two books, end quote. That's the last two years being the two years before the report came out in 2013. So I, I don't know, Jordan's been trying to pay, but maybe the payment system for the government wasn't working. This is a perfect example of a story where it's one side saying one thing and another side saying something else. The tricky part here is that you have the government on one side and Jordan Belfort on the other. Neither of them are known for being very honest. In the meantime, while Jordan and the US government can't agree on whatever it is they're arguing over these days, the victims of Jordan's scams aren't seeing any of what they've lost while Jordan lives a life of comfort. But Jordan has replied to the accusation that he hasn't paid his debts. In an article on the New York Daily News website, Jordan is quoted as saying, quote, When I saw the deadbeat accusation, I almost started crying. I can't believe something like this is happening in America. End quote. Today, Jordan Belfort runs a motivational speaking company, just like you see at the end of the movie. In fact, the guy who introduces Leo's version of Jordan at the very end, that is the real Jordan Belfort. Leonardo DiCaprio has a video testimonial on Jordan's site which says, quote, Jordan stands as a shining example of the transformative qualities of ambition and hard work, and in that regard, he is a true motivator, end quote. I'll make sure to put a link to Leo's video in the show notes. In the end, The Wolf of Wall Street was incredibly accurate to Jordan's book of the same name. A lot of what was said, we can only rely on the word of those who were there, people like Jordan and Danny. And since those people made their millions by lying, it's hard to know if they're telling the truth. Or are they just stretching the truth to get a better story and, by extension, sell more books? Perhaps our most convincing piece of evidence comes from an interview with FBI Special Agent Gregory Coleman, who told the New York Times... I tracked this guy for 10 years, and everything he wrote is true. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. If you want to learn more about Jordan Belfort, I'd probably start with Jordan's biography, also called The Wolf of Wall Street. It's filled with great stories that are bound to fascinate you. You know, if you're into the whole sex, drugs, and criminals on Wall Street thing... Thanks for listening to the Based on a True Story podcast. If you know someone who might be interested in hearing the true story behind movies, it'd mean the world to me if you would share the Based on a True Story podcast with them. You can also leave a rating and review on iTunes, and that helps the algorithms there bump the show higher so more people can find it. You can find all of the links, more episodes, and sign up for the monthly newsletter for the show over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Finally, if you've made it this far in the episode, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on Jordan Belfort and The Wolf of Wall Street. Let me know by getting in touch with me directly on Twitter, where I'm at Dan Lefeb, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. Thanks again for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.